All Nations Church. My name's Stu Weigel, and this is my buddy, Ebre, otherwise known as Pastor Eric. Good morning. And we're super excited that you're here, whether you're already part of our family or you're new to our family, we are happy that you're here. Um, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube, however you're connecting with us today, please chat with us, share us uh, any of your feedback, any questions that you have, we're excited. So excited. We love God. We love people. We love life. We're just pumped to be able to worship together today. Um, our mission, our vision, our goal is to bring all nations to Jesus Christ. And we just love to gather and worship Him. So would you join us as we just sing praises as loud as you can in your living room. Give it up today for Jesus. Worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. Oh, He has done great.
God, we ask you to come today and inhabit the praise of your people, Father God. Let your presence be known today, God. We worship you, Jesus, you and you alone. Sing our praise. Our praise becomes your
soul today. You sell out of earth. You sell out of earth. Let your faith arise today. Sing. You sell out of earth. Oh, sing. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at All Nations Church. My name is Rick Kirshner, the lead pastor, and we are so excited that you've joined us here this morning. We've got a great uh, service going on. Man, I I can hardly think. I just want to go back into worship after that worship time. Wasn't that wonderful? Man, I just keep want to praise the Lord, praise the Lord, because he inhabits the praises of his people. And man, I really sensed his presence in this room this morning. And I hope you can sense that in your living room too. Because when God comes, uh, he will really help you and your life and your circumstances. So I encourage you to just lean into God today. Well, uh, we're on the fourth of our sermon series, All Rise to Worship. And we felt as a church that just launched in September that it was really important to uh, focus on worship and what are the expectations. Uh, We have different people from many different churches, uh, many different uh, religious denominations, I mean, as well as many different young people come to the Lord and don't have an experience with Jesus Christ yet. So we're we're trying to re-kind of look at what the Bible says about worship and how we're called to worship. And our motto at All Nations are all welcome. And we just recognize that all people are welcome to come to God and come to know Christ in a way that he will uh, release himself 
uh, to them. So come and uh, meet Jesus and come and know him. And as you come and experience God and come to salvation, God calls us to um, go all in to a deeper relationship with him and that we want to grow with him and we want to rise up and uh, worship him. And the next level is we were called to uh, all rise and worship God. And, and as we grow in our maturity, as we begin to recognize Jesus, we get to get to know Jesus. Um, what we do is uh, recognize his heart is for people. His heart is for his church. His heart is for the lost. And so we're challenged to come and work with him. Come, he said, and become fishers of men. Be workers in the uh, harvest field with him. And so he challenges us to rise up and worship, rise up and live a life that would work with him and be with him and serve with him. And today's message is, is you know, all out and serve, understanding worship as warfare. You know, we're called to live a life and it's not supposed to be uh, lukewarm. It can be uh, exciting and alive as Christians. And he's called us to live all out for something. And most people are living all out for something, and it's not always God. But God is saying, come and live all out for me. Live a life of service, and your life will become a life of worship. Your worship will become warfare of the enemies of this world, which are also the enemies of God. So we're looking at that today. I'd like to start with um, a little thought about... um, you know, this whole thought about culture wars. We've had these discussions lately about culture wars, and certainly we've just seen the U.S. election, and there's all these discussions about cultures and different uh, challenges and things we see. I've heard many different uh, well-known national figures talk about these culture wars that we're experiencing in North America and even all around the world. And uh, it's not going to change. It's not going to get easier with uh, different political officials. We have, uh, we have different political opinions. We have different social opinions, different opinions. And so we all have different values. We think ours should win over somebody else's, et cetera, et cetera. And we're always going to have those. And we've had those things in the time of Christ, and we actually are having them again right now. The question is, as Christians, what do we do? What are the responses? And so many times people respond. uh, They just say, I'm going to hibernate. I'm just going to go and and just live my life, and I'm going to do my own thing, and I'm going to hibernate. And then we we also have people that say, well, I'm just going to go and pray. I'll just be a Christian. I'll go and serve the Lord. I'll pray. Excuse me. And then... um, Says uh, Somebody else says, I'm going to fight. I'm going to get in the battle and I'm going to fight. And we see pickets and we see signs and we see all sorts of stuff. And these are all good responses. These are all legitimate responses. If God is leading you by the Holy Spirit, then let him lead you and let him direct you. I want to talk today about uh, those that have decided to get in the fight. Those that want to be in fight, whether it's at home on your knees in prayer or whether it's out on the street with a picket sign, how does God want us to respond and how does he want us to fight? I remember a book I read maybe 10, 15 years ago called Blue Ocean Strategy. And the Blue Ocean Strategy uh, was a book that talked about uh, the business realm. And it, it was written around the early um, 90s. And it talked about, uh, talked about the business realm and the fact that companies fought in this uh, realm of competition. And the, the, the Red Ocean was where people just continued to fight. They built the same product. They competed with one another. And they just fought and fought and fought until they were all wounded. No company really did well. They were all wounded. They all just began to bleed. And they lived in this uh, context of a Red Ocean. And the Blue Ocean Strategy was this Harvard business book. And they said, we've got to learn to live above that. We've got to go to a different uh, level and maybe start to look at your climate and look at the environment and see that things have to change. And so uh, what they did is they started uh, creating something new and creating something fresh. And they were very successful because they thank, thunk, thunked, thanked. They lived and thought differently. And uh, yes, uh, so what they did, as you see it illustrated in the life of Chrysler. So Chrysler, the North American auto industry was just about, it was collapsing because of competition from foreign automobiles, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what we see was that uh, they created, Chrysler was just about defunct and it created the minivan. And the minivan had revolutionized, um, revolutionized the entire um, auto industry. And now this minivan became a, a great new uh, 
new automobile. The next thing we see is uh, the Ringley Brothers, which was a circus, and they entertained all over the world. They had tigers and lions and bears and clowns and all sorts of things. But the, the industry the, as an entertainment thing began to fall and collapse and do less and less and less. But the Blue Ocean strategy was applied to that, and we have Cirque du Soleil. And Cirque du Soleil, in the first three or four years, did more uh, gross sales than Ringley Brothers did in the entire hundred years before that. So, is blue ocean strategy from God? I don't think so. But the point is, we need to think differently if we're not going to just get the same old results. And that's what we want to talk about today. How do we worship? And how do we see worship as warfare and not worship as, uh, as just singing songs and it's nice to hang out on a Sunday morning? Worship is warfare. It has been given to us for God to use and to benefit our own lives, our families, but to benefit our community. Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you're just beat up? You're just doing the same old, same old. Uh, you know, you could be at home just raising your children and you don't seem to be getting ahead. Maybe you're a new entrepreneur and you're trying to break into the world and COVID hits. You invest all your money, you get everything lined up, ready to go, ready to launch this new business, and then this, the market collapses on you. And uh, it doesn't matter what you try, you try this, that, the other thing. And you continue to bleed. You continue to suffer. You continue to not be successful. Well, I want to tell you that God has said there is another way. We need to learn to fight the way God showed us how to fight. We need to get the victory. I remember myself, um, I was a, a cop and I was living life mediocre. And then all of a sudden I began to come to Christ and I'd known Christ as a young man, but I began to come to him and somebody introduced me to worship. Somebody introduced me to Ron Cannoli, actually, and uh, Ron Cannoli and some of the Hosanna Integrity singers. And as these guys began to sing the word of God, they began to manifest uh, the presence of God in my life. And I began to see the victory. I began to uh, recognize with what the word of God told me how to respond to the situations in my life. And as I learned how to respond to these situations, I learned to get the victory because I responded in a biblical response. And I want to encourage you today that if you would maybe need a place of victory, maybe you need a new mindset, that you listen to this message because it's going to show you how and encourage you maybe in new ways that you could worship so that you could experience the victory in every area of your life and also bring it to those people around you as well. So God has done so many great things. I'm so thankful what he's done in the church since he started. We've seen many people get born again. We've seen people's lives set free from bondages. We've seen people's marriages uh, turn back towards one another, and there's hope in their marriages again. So many great things God has done, but we're not satisfied. God has more for our families and our church, for our individual lives, for our community. He has more. So we simply cannot continue in mediocrity. We need to go to that next level in God's strategy to impact our lives, our church, and our community. And that's what this message is about today. Using our lives uh, to live a life of worship and service that the world would see Jesus and come to the hope that we've found and many have found in him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you for this message. I thank you for the anointing that's in this room, Father God, that you created because your word says you inhabit the praises of your people. I pray, God, today you would speak to each heart that hears this message. They would know what you're saying to them, and you'd give them the courage to respond, whatever it is, Father, so that we could live in obedience to you and your spirit, and we could live in the victory that you promised and that Jesus bought on that cross. Would you come and do that today, Father? We ask that, and we know you will, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, so this week, uh, we've, we're just about two-thirds of the way through our 21-day fast. Many people are fasting and praying. I don't know if anybody's getting thinner. I don't think I am, but I'm spending a little bit more time intimate with God, and I'm just enjoying, uh, you know, just spending some more time with folks in the church praying and interceding and, and getting to know people. So I encourage you. We've got a week left. Uh, you can go online. You can find the 21-day prayer and fasting, jump in right now. Do the devotions with us in the morning. Uh, tomorrow night uh, and all this week, we'll be having some worship. Uh, sorry, we'll be having the prayer meeting at 8 o'clock uh, every night. So tune in and we'll get you that link and, and join us even just for an hour. It will be great and you won't, uh, you won't uh, regret that you came. We're going to look right now at Ephesians 6, 10 to 12 as we look at how we're going to walk in this new strategy of worship as warfare. And uh, a final word, Paul said, um, a final word, uh, he said, be strong in the Lord and 
in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we, are, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So we need to start this worship as warfare by knowing that we are in a battle. Um, you know what? There's so many lives ruined and wasted when uh, I've seen I've seen children have challenges in their world because their parents didn't recognize there was a battle for their soul. I've seen people not do well in their personal lives because they didn't realize they were in a battle. Scripture says, Paul says, uh, we are in a battle. There's a battle for their, your soul. There's a battle for your life. The Bible says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. The devil wants to destroy anything that God loves. And God loves you, and he loves your family, and he loves our community. So recognize, we are in a battle, and the battle is looming. We need to get the victory. So we, we recognize we're in the battle. We need to know that these three things. We need to know our enemy. Who is the enemy? And uh, we need to know your equipment for the battle. What do you need to go into battle? Nobody goes into battle that doesn't uh, have the equipment. They don't uh, not know who their enemy is, but also they need to know God's strategy. How do they seize the victory? How are they going to move and maneuver in order to possess what God said that they would possess? What do we do? So number one, we need to know our enemy. Well, the enemy is the devil and, and the demons that have fallen from, from heaven. And it's very clearly, and, and the battle has already been won. He's a defeated foe. Say with me, the devil is defeated. The devil is defeated. And, and in Isaiah 14, 12, it talked about the story. Jesus recounts this uh, passage of Scripture when he talks to, in Luke 10, to the disciples. And he said, I was there when Lucifer... Um, when Lucifer tried to raise himself up to be equal with God. He said, he said I will make my uh, place with you. I will rise up and even be the, like the Most High. I will ascend and be like you. And as soon as Lucifer, that was his name, he was an angel. They, they say he was over worship and he was part of leading people to worship. But as he, he asserted his own free will and said, I will do it, I will do it, his pride took over and instantly God said, boom. And he cast him down to this earth. And Jesus said, I saw him fall like a lightning bolt to the earth as he was judged by Jesus the first time. So we need to know that our enemy, the devil, he is defeated. He's already done with him. The devil walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We need to recognize that uh, the devil is not omnipotent. He's not like we talked about God last year or last week. He's all places, all, you know, knowing he's not that. He's, he's a foe created by God. I always say the devil's God's devil. If the, if the devil wants to do something, he can't do it without God letting him do it. Know who the devil is. He's been cast down to the earth. And no, he just walks around like a roaring lion with no teeth, by the way, seeking whom he may devour. He can't devour you if you know how to live and you know how to walk in the spirit. And that's what we're equipping with you with today. He's just seeking whom he may devour. He has no authority. Jesus talking in uh, Luke, 7, uh, Luke 10, 19 said, look, I have given you authority, he said to the disciples, to tread on demons and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And that's where he recounts the story. He said, I was in heaven when Lucifer tried to rise up against God and God just went, blink, you're gone. And he sent him down. He said, the devil has no authority. He's been disarmed. and There's been a show made of him openly. Colossians 2 15 says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them public, publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus on the cross destroyed the work of the devil, destroyed death, hell, and the grave. So now all the devil is, is he's a liar. And that's why God hates. That's why God hates lies. Because God is truth. He wants us to emanate truth. He wants us to live in truth. So the devil's a liar. He deceives people by his lies. He tricks people by his lies. And so we need to learn to discern truth and to discern when the devil is speaking. We need to understand that. We need to live that and know it. He's a liar. And he's also a thief. Scripture says he comes to kill, to steal, and destroy. He would destroy if you could, if he could, but he can't because God is at work building you up, strengthening you up, encouraging you in the things of God. So the first thing, we need to know our enemy. He's defeated. The devil is defeated and you have authority over him in Jesus' name. Number two, you need to know your equipment. 
Um, we need to look at Ephesians 6, and uh, you can read that scripture. It says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God. We know the book of James says to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So we will have to resist the devil. We will have to stand against him when he attacks us. But we don't do it in our own strength. We do it in what the armor that God provided for us. And you can read it there in uh, Ephesians 6. The first thing you need to do is put on the belt of truth. You know, where would you be? The belt of truth kind of put on in every part of, of his armor in the old Roman centurion. All the armor actually held everything together, hold the, the girdle up and held everything up. So um, we need the truth. The truth of God's word is what is going to be our anchor of our soul. If we hide God's word in our heart, Scripture says we do it so we might not sin against God. So if we don't have God's word in our heart, then when the devil comes with a temptation or the lust of our flesh rises up, we won't be able to, we won't be able to walk out away from it because we don't have God's word in our heart. But if we hide our, uh, the word of God in our heart, Scripture says that we might not sin against God. So the truth is what we need. He said, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, you're truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And that's the good news that we've got for us today. So know the truth. Have the belt of truth in your life. It's holding you all together. We have the breastplate of righteousness. There's two righteousnesses that I want to speak about briefly. God says that because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we are now, once we accept Christ by faith into our lives, he said we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. So there's this shield, there's this, sorry, this breastplate of righteousness that protects us and guards our heart against weapons of the enemy, guards our heart against insult or injury or something that people have done to you. His righteousness is what guards us. But there's also a righteousness that comes as you willingly obey the Word of God. Every time the Spirit of God talks to you about you're about to sin, Spirit of God tells you you're about to sin and you resist that sin, you've stepped into a new level of grace and that's God's righteousness. So it's imputed to you because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, but then you live in it by every step of obedience. And two weeks ago, we talked about the cultivated presence of God. It's His righteousness that rise up in us that helps us be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. So we got the belt of truth, we got the breastplate of righteousness, we've got the feet uh, shed with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I tell you, when you adhere to the purposes of God, which is to take the good news to the world so that they would find hope and peace, when you begin to walk in that, and that's a priority in your life, and you align with God's purpose and you make that your purpose, then it's another weapon. It's a weapon. The devil can't attack somebody that's moving too fast. You're moving too fast as you're, as you're moving. You're doing this for someone, and the Spirit of God and angelic forces are coming to help you. You're doing this. You're bringing the gospel. The devil doesn't have a hope for somebody that's moving for God. I encourage you to get the, the, your shoes on that are prepared to tell people the good news in Christ. Learn to be a witness. Learn to tell the good news of what Jesus has done in your life and what the Word of God says He's yet to do. Be ready to tell people. Then there's the shield of faith. It's, it's another weapon that he holds up. Scripture says in Hebrews 11, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So there's a shield of faith. It said, by this shield of faith, you'll, you'll quench all the fiery darts of the devil. So the devil's out there. He's throwing things at you. He's saying, he's throwing a memory of what you did a long time ago. Oh, you did this, you know, and he's trying to shame you and make you feel guilty. And with your shield of faith, yeah, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You know, he says, it's written, the shield of faith rises up against this attack of the devil. No weapon formed against me shall prosper, devil. All those that rise up against me in condemnation shall be put to shame. That's the shield of faith. You get it on and you begin to use it as the devil attacks you. Again, it's closely related to the truth of the word of God. The truth of the word of God is what you hold up when the devil comes at you. He'll come at you with guilt. He'll come at you with fear. I tell you, fear is plaguing our world right now. Fear is the number one enemy of the entire world. Our economic system, our social systems, everything, our political realm, everything, it's fear. I tell you, deal aggressively with fear. Deal aggressively with fear in your own life. Deal aggressively with fear in your children's life. Deal aggressively with anxiety. I tell you, there's an onslaught of fear that has come with this COVID, and you need to stand against it. You know, just stand against it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. 
I am a child of God. Learn that song. Just begin to sing it. Begin to sing it as the devil comes in and says, you're not going to make it. You don't have enough money. You're going to get sick. Your girlfriend's going to leave you. All this say, get behind me, devil. And you do not yield to that fear that's trying to attack you, trying to steal your peace of mind. Deal with it with the uh, shield of faith. Then take on the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation is just trusting in Christ, yielding your life completely to him and let Jesus, uh, let you work out your salvation in your life. The the helmet of salvation protects you. Again, another level of protection. Now, the only aggressive or uh, proactive or offensive weapon here or piece of of, uh, armor is the sword of the spirit. And that's the word of God. We need to really encourage one another to be people of the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God. He said, again, if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Jesus made this very clear. The Word of God is living. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's ready to cut between the uh, things that you need to discern between. The Word of God will help you. He said, the Word of God is living. It's active, okay? It's useful for teaching us. It's good for challenging us or rebuking us. It corrects us when we've messed up our life and made a mistake. It teaches us how to take steps and live well. The Word of God is what we need to embrace. It's the sword of the Spirit. It's the weapon God uses to deal with the devil and break down strongholds that are around your life, around people's lives. So here's the the equipment that we need to wear We need to know uh, the devil is defeated. We know our enemy. He's defeated. We know our equipment and we know we've got it on. We know how to use it. And then we need to know God's strategy. How do we seize this victory? How do we walk into this? I mean, uh, how do we walk it all out in our lives? And you do have to walk it all out. It's not a half-hearted commitment. If if those people are commit, if you're committing to Christ and it's kind of a half-hearted commitment, I think it will be difficult to walk in any degree of real victory. God wants us to be all in, and God's encouraging you to take that next step of faith if it's a little one or a big one. Be all in. That's the difference in your life. I mean, I was raised a young Christian boy, raised, went to church every week. I did all those religious things, but until I went all in, my life was kicked around. I was kicked by the devil. I was abused by people. I was scorned and shamed and did all sorts of terrible things that I didn't like and I'm not proud of. But I didn't commit my heart completely to God. But when I did commit my life, when I said, I am going all in for Christ, something changed. So know the strategy, how to walk all in with Christ. So we know that Ephesians and many other scriptures says, you know, I have blessed you as a believer with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But we don't always know how to possess that. We don't know how to take hold of it. That's what we need to do. That's why we need to learn the strategy, how to receive the blessings of God. So number one, we need to know that the battle has already been won. I already talked about that, but this scripture I need to share. One, uh, Colossians 1, 12 to 14. God has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, through whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Wow, Jesus bought us the victory. We need to remind ourselves that. We need to know that. And uh, he destroyed death, hell, and the grave. He went to that cross. He destroyed it all. And he just left the world uh, now in a way that we can pick up the pieces and we can clean up the mess. And that's what he's given us the privilege to do. So how do we do that? How do we possess this? What's the strategy to walk in the victory, walk in this warfare that brings victory to our lives and the people around us? Well, Number one, you got to win the battle for your mind. You know, do you remember Jesus walking around in the Judean wilderness? So he went, he was baptized by John the Baptist. He adhered to everything that was required of him, of the religious ordinances. And then it says the Spirit of God led him into the Judean wilderness. He was out there. He was hanging out with the rocks, the scorpions, the uh, sunshine, the heavy, intense sunshine. He was just hanging out there. For 40 days and 40 nights, he was fasted. I wouldn't have lasted 40 hours. Jesus is out there giving her. He's going for it. He's consecrating himself to a life in the Spirit. And what happened? The devil came along after some time, after he was hungry, after he was thirsty, after he was worn out as a man. Remember, Jesus was fully God, but he was fully man. He was, wasn't operating in the desert as God. He was operating in the desert as a man. He was walking by faith. He was walking not by his circumstances, but by a life in the Spirit. 
that the devil came and tempted him. And what did he do? He just began to say, no, he knew the truth of God's word. And he, he said, man shall not live by bread alone. The devil tempted him to turn the rocks into bread and sustain himself. He said, no, I'm not going to do that. And the temptations came and the temptations came. And Jesus resisted. Why? He had control of his mind. You know, the majority of things Jesus said in the New Testament and when recorded in his life, the majority of the things he said were direct quotes from Old Testament scripture. Jesus knew the word of God. Jesus was not a guy. He was just downloaded super. He had this, uh, he had the, the, the God word chip, you know, stuck in his brain. He knew all this stuff. No, he spent the first 30 years of his life knowing the word of God and memorizing the word of God and learning the word of God. So when the enemy came in, his mind was renewed. He was restored. He recognized immediately a temptation from the devil and he dealt with it the way God said to deal with it, with the word of God. Jesus said to us, abide in me. And let my word abide in you and you will know the truth and you'll be set free. And I tell you, freedom is something that uh, you've got to go after. First, you've got to recognize where you're bound. And then you've got to say, God, what does your word say about this? How do I walk in that? How do I move in that? And God will help us do that. We need to recognize that the devil attacks our mind. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but they're mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down every argument and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Any thought that comes into our mind that takes us off of God's truth and God's word, we need to take it captive. There's a discipline in your mind. And when you learn to pray, you learn to meditate, you learn to look at the Word of God, God will help you renew your mind. And as you renew your mind, you'll be more and more sensitive to the attack of the devil and the voice of the Holy Spirit as he tries to lead you and guide you. So we use the Word of God to bind and loose. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. We recognize that it's possible for us to bind and loose because Jesus already bind and loosed it. Jesus already died on that cross. His blood was shed and poured out for the remission of sins that the devil was dealt with. And as a result, he was bound. And now we walk in that authority because Jesus has already bind him and loosed him. So the word of God, the scriptures will show us how to do this. Says, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, uh, there's uh, need to spend some more time in that scripture. But God tells us there's a, something coming at you. Just bind that for us in the name of Jesus. That's not what God's word says. So I do not receive that in Jesus' name. Again, and you learn to call those things that aren't as though they were. You need to recognize that God wants you to speak words of life and words of hope. Have you ever recognized um, the amount of times you're speaking things that are contrary to God's word? This happens at the office. This happens here and there. People don't maybe don't know the Lord. And all of a sudden, these, they're talking about things. And you get thinking, it's like, well, that's not true. That's not what the Word of God says. We need to know what the Word of God says. So when people are talking about different things, they're talking about this and that and the other thing, we need to recognize that that's not God's Word, and we shouldn't entertain that thought. We shouldn't put unholy things before us. We need to bind those things. We need to say, I will put no unholy thing before my eyes. This is how you keep your mind strong in the Lord. This is how you renew your mind from the old ways of thinking to God's ways of thinking. This is how you possess what God died on the cross for you to possess. This is how you walk and bring it into your life by renewing your mind. We need to learn to walk in the power of praise and worship. Two quick stories, Acts 16, you know this story. Paul and Silas, they were preaching the gospel and, 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 the, and they were thrown in this jail. And they were thrown in the jail and they were into the inner circles, the very inside of the jail, and they were bound with chains and fetters. There's many other people around them. It was about midnight. They begin to sing and they begin to praise the Lord. Now think of this picture. These guys have been beaten, probably thrown in there, no food. They were, they've been walking around 12 hours a day in the Israeli heat and the Middle Eastern heat, and it's brutal. Like they're just having challenges. And, uh, but there they are, they, uh, middle of the night, they decide they're going to start singing. They were bruised. They were hurt. They were hungry. They were tired. They begin to sing. Probably started, oh, hallelujah, you know, praise you, Jesus. And they begin, they begin to sing, and they begin to worship. I'm going to stand in the middle of a storm. 
Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. They begin to sing and they begin to declare the word of God. And all of a sudden, God sends this earthquake and the place begins to shake. The doors fling open and the fetters fall off them. And everybody else in that prison was set free that day too. And even their captive was set free because they begin to praise the Lord. They begin begin to not look at their circumstances, not look at their environment. They just begin to look at what God's word said. They praised him. They worshiped him when it wasn't comfortable, when it wasn't convenient, when they looked like idiots. And everything changed. Circumstances changed instantly like that. That's the kind of victory God's calling us to. If we change our mindset, let's not do things the old way. Let's do things the new way. All over the world, there's uh, worship gatherings rising up as people that are recognizing no political system is going to fix what's wrong in this world. No social system is going to fix it. There's not enough money. Nothing's going to fix this. We need to get God's kingdom to come here on earth. We need to get it to break through from heaven and down into the earth, down into our reality. And that's what God's saying is going to happen if people begin to start to rise up, begin to release the worship of God and know That it's not by might or by power. It's only by the Spirit of God will this kind of transformation come. Another great story, you all know it in uh, Jehoshaphat 2.20. Jehoshaphat, Israel went into the promised land and God said, okay, here's the land you live in, but these three or four areas you're not going to take. You're not going to beat them. You're just going to let them live. Next thing you know, all these armies are running on them. And so Jehoshaphat got the word, these armies are going to come and destroy you. Well, they're three big armies. Jehoshaphat, the Israeli army, couldn't defend themselves against that. Man had a word of, the, word of knowledge. He said, hey, this is what you're going to do. Tomorrow you're going to go out. You're going to prepare yourself. You're going to go out and you're going to meet the army. But you're not going to do anything. You're just going to praise the Lord. You're going to worship the Lord. So they went, they prayed, they worshiped, they fasted. They got up the next day, they went out. And Jehoshaphat says, look it. Uh, we're not going to put our guys with the bows and arrows up front. We're not going to do that. said, we're not going to put the, even the big, strong guys. We're not going to put the guitar players either in terms of worship. He said, we're going to put the singers out front. We're going to put the singers out front. The singers, went out and they began to sing, God is good and his mercy endures forever. And they began to worship and they began to worship. They stopped and they just watched as the other armies come in. They began to fight each other and kill each other. The last army that was left actually turned on itself and killed itself. The children of Israel did nothing but worship the Lord. This is a real story. Secular and uh, Jewish history books declare this and show this. What they did was worship the Lord. And I encourage you to find a place to worship. When you, you join arms and lock arms and move in the spirit with people, what happens? Psalm 22, 3, I love it. They sang it today, that God inhabits the praises of his people. He's enthroned in the praises of his people. His manifest presence comes to touch lives and reveal where people need to change. And he gives us the grace to change. God's love comes in and melts hearts when we worship. As we corporately come together in one spirit, united, grace for everybody that's in the room. No judgment, but we're just here to worship. We're here to acknowledge Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. When we surrender and say, God, I want you in this place, he comes and he moves. He releases his glory. So when we stand in that room singing, God comes. When we declare the word of God over our circumstances, he comes. We speak the word of God over our mind and our mind is renewed. We call those things that aren't as though they were. We bind powers and principalities. This is the place of transformation. This is the place of of off with your old and on with the new. The last thing we want to do is we want to live your life as an ultimate expression of worship. We live to serve. We live our lives in in radical submission to the Word of God, and we see that in Jesus Christ. What did Jesus do? Jesus lived his life in obedience to God's Word. This was the ultimate worship. So God's calling us to rise up and be servants to our families, servants to one another, servants to our community, and servants to our world. This is the ultimate warfare as we live for God and manifest his light and his love to the world around us. So what does this look like in your life? You know, what would it, what would it look like if, if we begin to uh, worship in a new way? You know, first thing in the morning, you get down there and get that music on and maybe not too loud. You don't want to wake the kids up. But man, begin to 
Begin to listen to worship. Begin to uh, let it penetrate you, not the TV and not the, not the negative news that's coming through. Let the Word of God uh, transform your mind. We've got a, an All Nations playlist that, uh, that is going to be released today and on social media as you'll see it. Get a hold of that playlist. Put Spotify playlist. Get it on. Listen to it and let it change your mind. Let it encourage you. Let it bring hope and encouragement to your life. Um, maybe sing a new song of thanksgiving. Recognize what uh, God is doing afresh in your life and just begin to sing out loud. Begin to thank Him. Um, this is awkward for people, but I guarantee when I begin to sing a new song, a song of the Spirit, a song that wasn't rehearsed by anybody else, a new song to the Lord, I sense the presence of God in a new way. God's inviting you to sing a new song of praise and watch how he empowers your life to live with more joy and more hope and more encouragement. How can we live a life of worship and praise today? So um, I just think as a church, you know, we've, uh, we've got to think of what it would look like. Imagine what it would look like. 400 spirit-filled believers just live in God with new joy and, and new hope and new encouragement. People are desperate for somebody that has hope right now. They're desperate for some people that have got a good testimony and a good story. Can we be that? Can you, can you encourage somebody this week? Give them a call and say, hey, I'm thinking about you, praying for you. Or you don't have to be all spiritual. Just, hey, I'm thinking about you. How you doing? Can I drop you off at a new Tim Hortons dark roast? I guess they got it better after the last five years. That's so they tell me. But <laughs> drop something off to people. You know, help people, encourage them. This is what God's calling us to do. Uh, this week, week of prayer, all week long, except Wednesday night, we're starting a new Freedom Bible Study. We encourage you to join us on that. The guys will tell you a little bit more about it later. So as we learn to live all out, to serve and approach worship as warfare, our lives are a living epistle, it says, read by all men. Live your life to serve others. Live your life to serve the Lord. Live your life as worship as warfare and watch what God will do. I'm going to give you a moment right now to uh, yield your life to God. Maybe you've never uh, accepted Christ. Maybe you've never been born again. And he's saying, hey, come. If you have a need, you don't have to, you don't have to do a whole bunch of things to get things right. You just have to come by faith and say, hey, I want to, uh, I want to come to Christ. I need his help. So he's just saying it's as simple as acknowledging your need for a Savior, acknowledging that your sin or the mistakes you've made have caused you to be separated from God. Just acknowledge that uh, you need Jesus and that He, you know that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. Just invite him in here right now. Just pray with me. You might also pray that God will just help you uh, yield your life to new levels of worship, that uh, you can experience him in a new way. And I encourage you to do that today as well. Just say, Hey, God, thank you that you sent Jesus to pay the penalty for my sin, to bridge that gap between me and the Father. I receive him now as my Savior and friend. Come into my life. Lead me and direct me in a life of service, a life of worship that will let people see you in my life. This is my prayer today, Lord. I'm trusting you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.
good. It's so good. What an amazing word today. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Uh, I, I, I love talking. There's so many stories there, but I love talking about the armor of God. And I love talking about the relationship between us and God, because I always think about my children. You know, you've got two beautiful girls, and I've got four crazy, amazing boys. And I, and I think about that conversation, because I think about God looking down upon me the same way that I look upon them. And so when I say things like, uh, or when they say things like, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, uh, I just can't, and I won't, uh, it breaks my heart. Like, it, it literally breaks my heart inside to see them do that, because I see the struggle that if they just tried, they could. And so I, I, what I remind me of is that God looks upon me the same way. And so what, I, what I'm able to do at that point is I remember the armor of God and I put on the belt of truth and I literally sometimes I like put it, I put it on. And, uh, and I'm like, that's not true. Like it's, I can do this. I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then when I go back and, I like, and I'm like, nope, nope, no, I can't do it. That's where the shield of faith comes in because I realize that I, I, I don't need my own strength. It's I lean on that faith and I can go to God and going, okay, God, I'm going to step forward. It's your job to have the strength for everybody to go there. So yeah, it, it's crazy. I love that. Yeah, it's powerful. It's powerful to, to teach our children that and to, to understand God sees us that way. Um, it's just, just so good. And it changes our lives when we start to um, not listen to those thoughts yeah. and understand that there's some things that we got to deal with that don't naturally just come to us and belong to us and just say, sorry, I, I don't believe that. That's not true. Just stand on the word of God and, and believe that. Amen. Um, super powerful. I'm, I'm just excited. I'm excited for you as you put this into practice, as you go forward this week and understand you're in a war that's already been won and start to live in freedom. I think you're going to see, I know you're going to see a change in your life and your family and your situation. And uh, it's going to be really good. I just want to invite you today. Listen, if, if, if this is your first time kind of joining us or if you want to get involved with the church, no more. If you have any questions, jump to our website, allnationschurch.co. You can scroll to the bottom of the page. There's a link there for a connect card. And that's just you saying, hey, I want to be a part of what's going on. Click that link. Fill out that information. Any questions, write it in the spot uh, for questions. And just let us know how you got connected with us tonight today we'd love to to meet you um yeah and the second thing i want to tell you is that is that uh we just love um you we're thankful for the people that are supporting us and we just want to let you know that you can share and support us financially again there's a link on the website you can find out more more information allnationschurch.co you can give in any way you want electronically it's all there and so you can do that so please uh Make sure you do that. We love uh, just sharing God's word, God's message, hope and life to Fort McMurray and around the world. And so we, we just want to give you the opportunity to partner in that with us. And like Pastor Rick said, 21 days of prayer. You got seven days left if you start tomorrow. <laughs> prayer and fasting. Prayer is maybe the easy part. Maybe not. It's yeah. hard to discipline yourself. But um, anyways, prayer and fasting. Seven days left. Jump in. You can do it. Seven days. It'll change your life. And fasting doesn't always need to be like just food, right? Like you could fast social media, you could fast TV, you could fast anything that you feel like you, that is overtaking you and you need in your life that you would like to replace with God and, and, and remove for prayer, right? Yeah, that's right. Anything. Yeah. Just just try it. Give something up and devote a little extra time to lifting your mindset, to focus on God and praying and just watch what he does. You won't be disappointed. I love it. And so, and if you are new or you've been around for a while and you haven't connected with the church and, and haven't been part of it yet, what we would love to invite you to do is to come join us at 11 o'clock. We've got Next Steps with Pastor Rick today. So go to our website, again, una, uh, allnationschurch.co. Click on there. We'll be able to join through that with Next Steps. We've got one and two today. Next Steps one and two. Three and four, my dude. Three and four today. <laughs> and there's a link. There's a link in the chat. Uh, oh, awesome. Link in the, in, the, in the chat on Facebook, and uh, and we'll get one in the comments on, on YouTube. So. Perfect. And if you haven't done one or two, no problem. You can jump in anytime, go through that. Um, as well as there's a Freedom Study Wednesday night. Uh, the link is on the, that link is on the website. And so join us Wednesday night. We're going to be going through uh, a Freedom Study. Uh, we'll do three Wednesdays, then we'll skip a week, and we'll do three Wednesdays. We're really excited about it. Yeah. 
Um, and it just, it takes our journey farther and it really understanding the power that God has for us. And so join us for that. We're really, it, it's going to change our life. Yeah, it's so good. I'm pumped. I can't wait to see what God is going to do. I'm really excited about what he has done. And uh, listen, just have a great week. Give your daughter a high five. Give your son a, yeah, a pound. <laughs> uh, you know what? Slap on the wall if you live in an apartment building alone. Wake up some neighbors. Tell them God's good. And we'll see you on Wednesday. Love you guys. Thank <laughs> you.